Martin, uh, for the Foundation for Data Research. I'm going to be talking about the extensible blockchain. Um, so, first, a little bit of history. Um, so, the internet and the web started out as you know, HTML. We had links. Links are really amazing. You can do a lot with hyperlinks, right? Pretty awesome. But you know, it was fairly static. Um, and later, uh, scripting languages were introduced, JavaScript. Uh, this, this really made the web be great. So, um, it was a major, major step there. But JavaScript in itself wasn't quite powerful enough. So, uh, browser vendors and third parties started adding plugins uh, for CPU intensive operations, such as Java and Flash. Uh, and then in the most recent iteration, we've seen HTML5 implement what you know browser plugins used to do natively <laughs> in the browser. Uh, and this has been really focused around video and audio since so those things are deemed to be most important. So where is this going next? Uh, in 2012, there was something called the Extensible Web Manifesto that was written by several founding members, or several very influential members of the web community, including Brian Benton and Egg, creator of JavaScript. Uh, you can look it up more online if you're interested. The gist of this, though, was it was focused on adding new, low-level capabilities to the web platform that were secure and efficient, uh, and expose those low-level capabilities, and use that to explain existing features of the web. Um, then lastly, to develop, describe, and test the new high-level features in terms of the low-level capabilities. And the overall goal here was to contain new service where we add a new feature to a web browser, that uh, that feature is exposed to uh, potentially malicious code. Um, so we have to be really careful with that new stuff. Uh, we need to reduce the rate of growth and complexity, and therefore bugs in implementation. Uh, each new feature, every all browsers, you know, once it starts gaining popularity, all browsers need to implement. Uh, and if you try to implement a browser today, you, it's not an easy task. Right? There's a lot of things to uh, implement, and uh, to allow browser <coughs> vendors and library authors to integrate on libraries that provide developer-friendly high-level APIs. Uh, you can't do that if we just start off by putting in um, an API directly, because then it's stuck, it's hard to remove. Um, so instead of having these problems, if we have low-level capabilities that can describe the high-level capabilities, we can circumvent a lot of these problems. So here's some of the things that have come out of the Accessible Web Manifesto. WebAssembly, WASM, Canvas, uh, WebGL, SMDJS. And I think the overall picture here is that these things are useful generalities. And I define a generality in software development uh, as an axiom or a low-level feature that can be used implement two or more high level, desired high level features. And you know you have a user, useful generality when the axiom or a set of axioms not only encompass the desired high level feature, but also reduce your implementation's complexity. Right? So if you can find something that describes a bunch of things that people want and reduce your, your implementation complexity, you know you're going on the right path. So how does this map to the blockchain? So um, we started with Bitcoin, which is kind of like HTML in a way that was very static. Uh, so scripting was actually uh, more dynamic early on in Bitcoin's history, and then it was uh, restricted fairly fast. Um, but then, but then people wanted to do more of this, so we started building app coins and trying to do stuff hacky stuff with upper term. Uh, this is you know, roughly acknowledgeable, uh, roughly equivalent to maybe like the first version of JavaScript. And then we have uh, Ethereum. 
coming in, uh, which is a better analogy to having a full scripting language. Um, but it wasn't, Ethereum is, the uh, Ethereum virtual machine isn't quite powerful enough to handle precompiles, so we have to add precompiles. And this is uh, somewhat equivalent to having uh, browser plugins like Flash or whatnot. And it's the same pressure, the same rationale uh, for both of those things to exist. Right? The rationale for having browser plugins and the rationale for having precompiled is the exact same, same development pressure and reasons. Uh, so, yeah, where can this go from here? Uh, can we build an extensible blockchain along the same lines as the extensible web manifesto? So, I think it's almost even more important to have an extensible blockchain than extensible web. And that's because new capabilities uh, require hard force. And this is really hard to uh, come to consensus on, on a social level. Like browsers don't have to worry about this. Like one browser can implement whatever set of features it wants, and that's fine, people can use it. But it doesn't quite work that way in blockchains. Like you have there, everyone has to have, uh, all the clients have to have the exact same set of features uh, to operate correctly. There is a very strong incentive against expanding the trust and computing base, right? Uh, we've seen this before. Like, um, there's there's two attack vectors in blockchains, right? Uh, in browsers, we have one. We have malicious code that's trying to break out of the jail, uh, trying to break out of the uh, uh, um, uh, yeah sandbox. Uh, but in blockchains, we have two possibilities. Malicious code trying to break out of the sandbox and uh, trying to break consensus. So if um, code can just get one of the clients to um, operate non-deterministically and produce a different result, then it breaks consensus and all those clients fall off the network. So I think there's even a stronger incentive in the blockchain world to be careful with how big our trusted computing base is. Um, and it's really hard to iterate future features in blockchains. Um, in the web, it's a little bit easier. Like, uh, for example, uh, Web SQL was a thing, and then it got deprecated um, later on. We can't. It's really hard to deprecate old Opera codes and old things in the blockchain world. Um, so yeah, it's hard. So here's what we face today. Um, we have a rather large trusted computing base. Uh, we have to trust that. Uh, all the code for all the precompiles are correct. We have to trust the VM is correct, and we also have to get the state rules correct. Um, and we want to expand, right? We want to add more precompiles, elliptic curve arithmetic, uh, big number arithmetic, elliptic curve pairing functions are some things. And maybe later on there's proposals also for um, like two and SHA one. There's probably more heaps that I've missed for different precompiles. Also, SHA 3's instruction is not a pre-compiled, but I'm going to throw that in there because uh, it sort of fits with the rest of them. Um, and in IPC layer, we also are facing sort of the same uh, growth. Um, we currently have uh, one and two odd IPC methods. Uh, so we have call and call code, delegate call code. Although call delegate call code, you could argue, uh, may not count for IPC because you're not, uh, you're just, uh, it's more like an eval statement, you're loading code from a given address and processing it in the current context. Uh, and we have upcoming new IPC methods such as uh, call static and call pure. Um, and in the VM level, we have um, all these state and environmental operations, so, uh, blockchain, self destruct, uh, balance, origin, etc., etc. So these are all our codes used to access the state. And uh, also in the VM level, um, our current art of arithmetics are only 256 bit operations, and we have no shift operations so that wouldn't exist. But uh, upcoming changes may alleviate that problem with the addition of 64-bit oper wide operations and shift operations and uh, possibly sim operations. So these are the things we want to build, right? Uh, um, and we also we also have an interpolarity problem. It's hard to um, 
uh, be built break code that uh, uh, works with things outside the, the, the Ethereum ecosystem. And it's fairly hard to, it's a little bit tricky to target a, a language for the EVM. So I think the really big takeaway from this is all these things we want to add and change, like making, making uh, uh, greater interpolarity, greater uh, power for the VM. Uh, we need to be really careful that we don't expand our trusted computing base. Big trusted computing base is really bad for symmetric computation platforms in general. Um, so, uh, I think a better future would look something like this. Uh, instead of building app horizontally, we should build things vertically, starting with uh, having a good virtual machine that's uh, performant enough that we can build everything inside the VM. Um, so this goes back to a low-level feature that we can use to describe high-level features. Um, so instead of building things horizontally, we should build things vertically to minimize our trusted computing <laughs> base. And I think the natural, uh, the natural outcome from this is we sort of get, uh, come up with a waste thin protocol. Um, we see waste thin protocols in networking stacks, and this is a common pattern that we see in nature also. And you know, I think it's a good, uh, a good metric that you're on the right track with protocol development. And you see this sort of a pattern emerge. Um, for us, we have a high pressure to have a small uh, trusted computing base right in this layer, and then everything else built on top of it. So I think there's a risk of becoming a big ball of mud if we don't do this. Um, so if we don't have good abstractions for the way we add rules and think about adding rules, we risk of having parts of the system communicate uh, with other parts of the system that part or should be logically separated. Um, so instead, we should think about this in a, uh, as a modular system. So a uh, file system networking being provided by something like IPFS or Swarm or some other content addressable uh, file system. And uh, networking divided by um, you know, uh, peer to peer networking loops. And then on top of that, we should have an uh, abstraction for the inner process communication for our contracts, much like a microkernel. Uh, something like this should be useful even outside the system, right? It should be modular. And then on top of our IPC layer, we should have a consensus layer. Um, and I think it makes sense to move more and more things into the microkernel layer um, as it comes uh, as we can. So, what kind of low-level primitives do we need? Well, I think a performant risk like uh, VM, like WebAssembly, is a prerequisite. Um, I think eventually we're going to need non-atomic messaging. I think most of the sharding schemes involve uh, non-atomic messaging. Uh, this is actually a little bit debatable, but um, yeah, I, I think we will. Um, we need a file system like model for I.O. Uh, you know, be able to create a clean, clean view of the state tree on top of it, um, and some sort of like microkernel abstraction for IPC management. So you might ask, like, oh, this this sounds <laughs> like maybe overkill, but uh, yeah. Um, so so did uh, assembly programmers at one point, and so did uh, C programmers <laughs> at one point, and uh, so did Bill Gates <laughs> at one point. <laughs> And uh, so did Paul Stozik at one point. Um, can't be much every Bitcoin and maximalist. Uh, so I d no, I don't think this is overkill. I think I think we're going to keep shoving more and more stuff into the blockchain. I think it really is uh, a consensus platform, and I think it will have a similar uh, trend as you know Moore's law. Moore's law is kind of dead, but uh, you know the the law of diminishing or, or uh, exponential returns is still alive. Um, so uh, I think we'll face a similar situation where people are going to try to cram more and more into this consensus platform. Um, so we need room to expand and grow. Um, so can there be a better way? And I'm going to let that